Good evening, this is Pastor Barbara, a.k.a. Preacher with Paris. Today is the 13th of September of um, 2015, and we're in our Sunday evening Bible study. On Sunday evenings, we are in the New Testament. On Wednesday evening, we're in the Old Testament. On Sunday morning, we're whatever occurs to me would be something we should study. We started a new series this morning about sadness and other things, depression, that lead people to suicide attempts. I've dealt with three to four people in the last couple of weeks and one of them was successful in his suicide attempt. He shot himself and it took a week uh, for him to succumb, but he did. And his funeral will be next week. So we're talking about how to deal with the things in our life that might possibly cause us to believe we have no hope or that it might be better to just end it all. So that's what we're doing Sunday morning. We have just completed the book of um, Acts of the Apostles, but we didn't go all the way through it. I don't have that Bible in front of me now. This happens to be the New International Version. But the Bible that we're using as our guide is the Rhesus Chronological Version, which means we're going through and studying things in the order in which the events there and mentioned happen. So we just ended where Paul was in his own home. He was renting it, but he was a prisoner. And this is toward the end of Paul's ministry. He's getting ready. And I'm older than I've ever been before. I'm finding I can't do as much in a given day, in a given week, as I used to be able to do. Um, just a little bit ago, blowing on the um, uh, pan flute, I blow into it. Less wind goes into the pan flute. That happens as you get older, and you have to start making plans. If you've begun a ministry, or if you're doing something, is it going to end when you die, or is somebody else going to carry it on? Paul had a very unique ministry. The best educated of all Jewish leaders, a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, having been taught at the feet of, feet of Gamaliel, which when Gamaliel was a member of the Sanhedrin, he not only had learned as much as you could learn from other people. But God chose him specifically to lead the non-Jews who were becoming Christians. At this point in history, there were two kinds of Christians. 
there were those Jews who had heard Christ preach, who knew his ministry. There were still many alive who had seen him die. Many of them had seen him after his resurrection. He was on earth another 40 days. And they said, we believe him. We believe he was the son of God. We believe he died for our sins. We believe he is who John the Baptist said he was. We believe he's Messiah. They were Jews. Every Sabbath morning, they went to the temple. When they would go to the temple, or if they didn't live near the temple, there were synagogues. Synagogues are places of worship where ten or more male Jews, that would be uh, young men who have been bar mitzvahed. There was no bat mitzvah in those days could have a rabbi and could hold worship services. They were worshipful. They were educational. They would read. What would they read? They would read the prophets. They would read the law and they would read the history. So we had Jews who, beginning from the time that Christ died, was resurrected, and ascended into heaven to be seated at the right hand of his Father God, we had Jewish believers. If something were to happen and you would make a major change in your life. Most everything in your life would stay the same. You'd live in the same house. you have the same family. You would go to your same job. You would still eat the food that you like to cook and like to eat. Most of your friends would remain the same. Um, in this case, these Jews accepted Christ's teachings, believed he was Messiah. And their lives were similar to ours. They prayed. If they lived in Jerusalem or nearby, they went to the temples. If they didn't, they went to the synagogue. They studied the law just like we studied the law. We don't practice the law. We don't believe the law saves us. But on Wednesday nights, we're in the Old Testament. Uh, we're studying it as they did. They continued to eat the same food, have the same friends. There were areas of their service, which was now Christian service, they accepted Christ as Messiah. Other Jews did not. Those Jews that did not and fought those who did were called Judaizers. They did not accept Christ 
as Messiah, and that was the difference between the two kinds of Jews, Jews who accepted Christ as Messiah and Jews who didn't. But then we have what we talked about the last two Sunday nights, the mystery of the gospel. This is exciting to me. The mystery of the gospel. The fact that non-Jews could come to Jesus. These were people that ne had never gone to temple in their whole life. They weren't Jews. Why would they be going to temple? They never brought sacrifices. They never kept the Jewish law. Why should they? They weren't Jews. But when Paul met Christ in Syria, well, he was on his way to go to Damascus, and he had an encounter with Jesus, and he accepted Christ as his personal Savior, he spent a little time there. Then he went out to the desert in Arabia and was there for about three years. And just like Moses was on Mount Sinai and God spoke with him personally and taught him things, Paul was taught things by Jesus himself and by the Holy Spirit. We don't know a lot of the details except when it comes to Paul's teaching, then we know the things that he was taught. Well, now he's ministered. He's been out to Europe and back a couple of times, been shipwrecked. Some places he'd go, he'd spend six months, some places three years. He would establish a church, he would teach. He was the one apostle called to minister to the non-Jews. The first apostles were 11 of 12 of Jesus' disciples, not counting Judas Iscariot. And another one had been elected to take Judas's place. They were apostles, church leaders responsible for making decisions that would govern the whole body of Christ and the way the, the church would carry on. But Paul, Paul was more Jewish than Jesus' disciples. They were fishermen. They were not scholars. They were not preachers. They listened to Jesus teach for three and a half years. But Paul was a a scholar. Paul could answer any question you would bring up about anything that any Jewish scholar, the high priest, for example, might know. Except he had these additional occasions when God taught him things. And he wrote most of the New Testament. Well, now, he's old. The one thing that he wanted to be sure to do while he was alive was to go to Rome and give his testimony to Caesar Augustus. And now he's thinking about the future. Timothy is like a son to him. 
There are a few young people that I look at as though they were my children. In some cases, they are. We call them our spiritual children. The one that leads you to Christ or is your mentor in the ministry, you think of as your spiritual father. Paul writes two letters to Timothy. This is the first one. The letters always start out saying who he is, who he's writing to, and why he's writing. Paul, so now we know who wrote it, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. Why does he put that in there? He wants them to know that the things he's saying are important. He's doing this by God's command, writing these things to Timothy. Verse 2. To Timothy, my true son in the faith. And then his wish for him. Grace. What is grace? A blessing from God that you don't deserve, but God gives it to you anyway. That's why we call it amazing grace. If you deserved it, if we were worthy of it, it would be one thing. But since we're not worthy, it's amazing that Christ would do for us what he has. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Those letters start with this blessing. Now he gets into why he's writing this letter. As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, while he was in Macedonia, he had told Timothy, Stay in Ephesus. Ephesus is the city where the Ephesians lived. That you may command certain men not to teach false doctrine any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths. Paul said, I was in Macedonia, and I think his spiritual son would like to have gone there. Macedonia is in the northern part of Greece. And Timothy was in part of what is now called Turkey. They were in Europe, not in the Mideast. But Paul at that time had said, don't come. I'd love to see you, but don't come. I need you there. I need you there because there are people teaching false doctrine. Why do we have so much concern about false doctrine more than we do now? Because Christianity was new. Nobody been a Christian for, but I've been in the ministry 62 years. Paul hadn't been in the ministry for 62 years. Nobody had. It hadn't been that long that Jesus was resurrected and ascended back into heaven. So everybody was a new Christian. When those of you that are newer Christians run into problems, and you run into something in the Bible you don't understand, what do you do? You go to somebody that's been a Christian longer than you. Somebody that studied the Bible more than you. 
When you've got a problem and you don't know how to deal with it, you go to somebody that's had that same problem and they know how to deal with it. There weren't any experienced people. Now we refer to them as elders. It doesn't necessarily mean old people, it just means experienced people. And usually that means about the same thing. You, how much experience can a 20-year-old have? A 40-year-old can have more experience than a 20-year-old, but not somebody that's been ordained for next year in 16 it will have been 60 years that I was ordained. That means that I had been a minister for over 60 years, because you just don't start out in the ministry and start out as ordained, not in most churches. You're doing some uh, individual churches, you don't belong to organizations and just come along and make their own rules and if they decide that I remember when I wanted to complete my doctorate and I had had to pull out of school because of illness I don't know how it is now but in those days you had to Complete a doctorate within seven years, because if you have a doctorate in an area, you are supposed to be an expert in that area. And when you're working on your master's thesis and when you're working on your doctoral dissertation, you have to pick a subject that nobody is an expert in. And you have to become an expert in it. Well, because things change. If you don't complete your work within seven years, something else is now taking its place and it's no longer the latest and most important thing to study. And because I had to pull out of school, I was looking to find a quick way to complete my doctorate. And I found that there are organizations <laughs> and they built colleges and they make their own rules and if you give them a hefty amount of money five thousand up and write what I'm going to call an essay I've written a master's thesis I have written a doctor's dissertation. They are harder to write than a book. Because in a book, if you don't want to deal with it, you just don't deal with it. You're your own boss. But if you're writing a thesis or a dissertation, you got to follow certain rules. And I saw that there are places that will let you write like a report or an essay, maybe 30, 40 pages, and they'll give you a doctor's degree. But I'm talking about the older, more established churches, the ones that we sort of had confidence in. Not, well, maybe I didn't state that too well. I don't mean that I don't have confidence in, 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 in some of the newer ones or the independent organizations. But there's a saying in academia, the degree is only as good as the college or university it comes from. And if they got a reputation for taking your money and shoving you through a class, Hospitals don't hire doctors from those universities. Good schools don't hire teachers from those universities. So if you want 
a school that's respected. You go to one that requires a lot of you. So, Paul is now getting ready to sort of retire, at least slow up a little. And he's saying, I urge you, I told you, I was in Macedonia, you weren't that far away. And I told you to stay there. To do, there are people that are going around teaching false doctrines. You can't. It would be sort of hard for somebody to knock on my door and convince me of a false doctrine. As a matter of fact, last fall, two people did. I'm sure they've knocked on your door. By the time they left, we had agreed <laughs> that if there was anything they wanted to know about the Bible, they knew where I lived. They had showed up on my doorstep. Well, I don't have a doorstep. I have a bridge. I live in a mountain. <laughs> they had showed up on my bridge to convince me of certain things. But they were not able to. Because I had too many years of study, of work, of teaching others, four different Bible colleges, three different countries, two different languages. It's a little hard to come and convince me that only one version of the Bible is good and it's theirs. But if I'd only been a Christian for two years and they were very experienced and very well schooled at what they do, they might have had a chance. There weren't any long-time Christians in those days. They were all new. Paul was the one that Jesus taught out in the desert along with the Holy Spirit. He was the master teacher. Most of the rest of them had to count on the Holy Spirit keeping them from getting into false doctrine because somebody that could talk to talk could maybe talk them into a debate. And just because you can debate good doesn't mean what you're teaching is true. So he said, I told you to stay there. Because there were certain men that were teaching false doctrines and not to devote themselves to myths or to endless genealogies. What is a genealogy? We have one in Matthew and we have one in Mark. It starts, one of them starts with Adam and Eve. Another one starts later than that. But it's so-and-so had a child, and his name was Jesse, and he had a son, and his name was David, and he had a son, and his name was Solomon, and he had a son. That's a genealogy. We go through them because the first time through the Bible, I committed to read every word. This time through, I didn't make that commitment. This time through, I said we will go through it chronologically. But if we come to a list of names, 
I'm just going to tell you the next eight verses as a list of names, and I'm not going to pronounce them all. Why would a person want to go to a group of Christians and go to wherever they were meeting, get on their program or whatever, and start reading genealogies? Come on. Let me, uh, let me get one of these genealogies. Here we go. Hang on. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Paris and uh, Zerah, the mother was Tamar. Paris, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Why would I want to go to where a group of Christians were meeting and they would say, you have anything you'd like to say? Would you like to share? And they get up and read that. Why would anybody read that? To draw attention away from the truth. Don't you love it when somebody comes into my program and starts saying, well, I disagree with you. Well, fine. Start your own program. Preach what you want to preach. If you don't know how to start one, I'll help you. But not on my program. But that's how a lot of people want, they, they don't want to start with one and say, let's build a church. They say, ah, there's 40 people meeting on such and such a day over there. Let's go get that church for ours. Let's tell them what we believe. Let's get them to believe like us. Paul and others like him started churches from scratch. They taught. Because they knew what they were talking about and because the Lord was with them, many people were converted. And there were these people, they wanted to get churches that already existed. But you have to, in order to do that, you've got to get their mind off of the truth and onto something else. And he was told him they were reading gene genealogies. They don't devote them, uh, they devote themselves to myths, things that aren't true, just stories. Oh, I remember 10 years ago I was out in such and such. Stories are fine. Stories are not scripture. Hi, AJ. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is built by faith. Anybody can go out and talk. How about working all week to get a program together for Wednesday, for Sunday? Oh no, let's just show up and let's just act like we know a lot and let's just take over somebody else's work. He says, the goal of this command, what command? Well, he said earlier, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, and Christ Jesus our hope. In other words, God told me to write this. So now he says, the goal of this command, the reason I'm writing you, the goal is love. And it comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, 
and sincere faith. Why am I writing you? Well, I'm writing a lot of love. My reasons are good. My conscience is clear. I have no bad motive in writing this to you. Some have wandered away from these and turned to meaningless talk. These people that go around with false doctrine, and if you don't know the truth, then how do you know if you're listening to a lie or not? They want to talk meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know what they're talking about or what they so confidently affirm. My dad would have called them windbags. Just chat, 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 chat. When you got all through, what did they say? I don't know, but it sounded good. We know the law is good. Now, remember I told you there were some Judaizers. There were two kinds of Jews. Jews that believed Jesus was Messiah and Jews believed that Messiah was still coming and Jesus was not the Messiah. They had a tendency to keep up Jewish habits, Jewish customs, Jewish food, Jewish holidays. I mean, why would they? I had stopped celebrating the 4th of July because I accepted Christ as my Savior. I got a, today when I was um, getting ready for tonight, I found this little patriotic pin. I didn't leave my past history when I became a Christian. I just added more to it. So there's no reason not to study the law but to study it to the exclusion so that you keep people's minds on the law and on your past, that's good. History is good. And if you don't learn from history, you wind up repeating it. We know the law is good if one uses it properly. Christ came to fulfill the law. So when we teach the law, it's a blessing to us. We say, see what the law taught? And look what Jesus did. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly, and the sinful, the unholy, and the irreligious. For those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for adulterers, for perverts, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. You know, when we're in church, or in our home and, and all of our Christian friends are visiting us. We don't need a law. I don't have a policeman living at my home so that when I have guests, one guest doesn't kill another one. We are law abiding. So we don't need a law. If it were just us, we wouldn't need it. Ah, but it's not just us. There are people 
with the law said they couldn't walk in our house and take off with our stuff. One of the birds is down here. <laughs> yeah, that's daddy. That's the daddy bird. Well, I'm going to let him chew on my shoelaces because if I don't, he's going to be chewing on the cords around the computer. So I'll just let him stay down there. Now, my friends aren't going to take things out of my house. My Christian believer friends are not going to steal from me. They're not going to do bad things to me. They're not going to hurt me. If it were everybody was serving God and everybody loved everybody, we wouldn't need police officers. We wouldn't need courts. We wouldn't need judges. But life isn't that way. So we do have to have the law. And for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which he entrusted to us. Now we have about eight verses to finish this chapter. And then we get to that portion that I told you was very controversial. And I'm just going to read it to you and tell you what it is. And wait till next Sunday to explain it because there won't be time. But starting at verse 12, it says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me faithful. He appointed me his service. That's how Paul got to be an apostle. God made him one. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. Let me um, see if I can find something here real quick. And if I can, I'll read it to you. If I can't, find it in a hurry. I will just tell you what it says. I am X two. And six. And I'm about to come to what I'm looking for. Chapter 7, well, at the end of chapter 6, Stephen, who had just been made a deacon, because the apostles had so much to do and, and Christians enjoyed being with other Christians so much that they ate at each other's house every day. And the apostles got so busy just serving food and telling people where to sit that they said, we really need to devote ourselves to teaching and to prayer, and we need other people under us to do this. And they chose one man, his name was Stephen. And opposition arose from members of the synagogue of the freedmen. Those were Jews from Alexandria in Sicily and Asia. They began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by which he spoke. 
so they made up a lie. I mean, when you can't use the truth against somebody, try a lie. They persuaded some people to say, we heard Stephen speak blasphemy against Moses and against God. You don't tell good Jew that somebody was blaspheming Moses. So they stirred up the people and they went to the Sanhedrin. They said, this fellow never stops speaking against the holy place. We've heard him say Jesus of Nazareth is going to destroy the holy place, the temple. Well, I'm going over now to chapter 7. And they decided to kill Stephen. In verse 57, they got ready to stone him. 55 says, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up into heaven, and he saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing, and Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. But just as they were getting ready to kill Stephen, the first deacon, he stood. And Stephen says, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they covered their ears. And they yelled at the top of their voice. And they dragged him out of the city to stone him. But those that were going to throw the stone you all know what an overcoat is? I grew up in Michigan. An overcoat is a heavy, warm winter coat. You can't throw a stone if you're wearing mittens, gloves, overcoat. So they took off their outer garments and they said, we got to have somebody look after our, our stuff while we go kill this deacon. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That's what we all say. The last words before the angels take us into the presence of the Lord. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, talk about forgiveness. They haven't even killed him yet. But he wants God to forgive them for what they're going to do. He fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this against them. And when he said that, he fell asleep. Now, we've talked before that early first century Christians referred to each other as saints. Later, they began calling, somebody else began calling them Christians, but they referred to each other as saints, and those that died, they referred to them as having fallen asleep. Because knowing that when the Lord returned, they would rise and go with him. 
and Saul was there giving approval to his death. This same Paul that years later has met Jesus on the road to Damascus. God has taken him out in the desert and taught him spiritual things that many people will never understand. Now he says, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. He watched the cloaks of those who killed the first deacon because they weren't his kind of Jew. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. He thought he was doing the right thing. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with faith and love in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. In the New Testament, uh, uh, I don't mean New Testament, in the King James Version it says, Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. This says, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy. So they and me, now I'm one of the worst of the sinners there was. Jesus could show patience. As an example of those that would believe on him in the future. Well, we have only about two or three verses more to go. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you. Somebody prophesied about Timothy? Yeah. We have it in the book of Acts, but we have it in the fourth chapter of Timothy also. In 1 Timothy 4, command and teach these things. Let no man look down on you because you're young. He was young. And sometimes older people won't look at somebody young and admit that they're doing a good job. He says, you're young. But set an example. Set an example for believers in speech and the way you talk, in life, in love, in faith, in purity, until I come. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. Read the Bible out loud in church. To preaching and teaching. When you read it, explain what it means. Don't neglect the gift that was given to you through a prophetic message. 
when the body of believers laid hands on you. That's something called ordination. And you're probably referring to an occasion when he was ordained. When those elders in the faith uh, the night Rose and I were ordained, um, we were in Texas, and one of the leaders of the church in Texas, and because we were so close to the border, one of the leaders in the church in Mexico, two different countries, same church. One of them laid hands on me and one of them laid hands on Rose, as well as leaders of, of our uh, own area. But he says, don't neglect the gift that was given you through a prophetic message when a body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone can see your progress. You're young. They're going to watch you. They're, they're wanting to know. You, you're going to make it or not. Are you the real deal or hanging on? Are you a wannabe? Give yourself so that everybody can see your progress. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. If you're not sure about something, don't say it. Don't make any mistakes because the older ones are going to be looking at you and see if you're the real thing or not. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Hang on. Not for a day, not for a month, not for a year. Hang in there. Because if you do, that's being faithful, being true, being honest, you will save both yourself and your hearers. He said, Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you. I just read from chapter 4 where he refers to that occasion before. So that by following them, you can fight the good fight. Holding on to faith with a good conscience. Some of these have rejected these and have shipwrecked their faith. You know what happens to a, a boat that shipwrecked? That's the end of it. You can't put splinters together and repair a shipwrecked boat. If your faith is shipwrecked, it doesn't exist anymore. Among them, and he names names of some of them, are Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. That's the end of chapter 1. Let me explain what he means by I've handed them over to Satan. It's not a pretty picture. It's not anything that any minister would want to say I have handed somebody over to Satan. But if somebody is going to try to uproot a church 
that was planted by an apostle. Where the truth is being preached and they're doing a good job and you come and you try to ruin it. You try to teach a bunch of nonsense like the people he mentioned tried to do. And take a work that the Holy Spirit has blessed and that a gifted apostle like Paul has started and turn it into something else. Two things can happen to you. If there's a man of God, if there's a prophet, if there's an apostle, if there is a church leader and you run into somebody that is basically trying to kill the church, turn it into something else. You can do one of two things. You try to talk with them and reason with them and show them how wrong they are and tell them you're not welcome in this place doing what you're doing. You say, isn't everybody welcome in church? Not when you're fighting what the church is trying to do. You're trying to win people to God and they want to read genealogies. You want them to be faithful. You want to teach them the scripture. And they want to make trouble. You're welcome in a church. When you cooperate with them, or you don't have to cooperate. It's like um, guests on our cast programs. Everybody's welcome. Some people are helpful and they add to the program. That's good. But even if you don't add anything, if you never type anything, if you don't say, I enjoyed it, if you don't click on that green thumb, <laughs> If you do nothing, you're still welcome. Until you try to tear down what we're trying to do. And then you're not welcome. And Paul told Timothy, these people that are trying to tear down the work of God they're in Ephesus. I gave them over to Satan. That's it. I tried to reason with them. I tried being friendly. I tried praying for them. Tried being one of the good guys. No. They want to destroy the work that God's doing. Sorry. We're not letting God's work destroyers in this evening. I remember one time I was pastoring a church nearby here because they didn't have a pastor. It was an English-speaking church. And I worked only in, with a group that spoke Spanish. But they asked if it's hard to get somebody to go up on the mountain and pastor. So they said, could I pastor until they got somebody? So I was there for two or three years. And this man came in early. And he'd been drinking. 
And he said, am I welcome? And I said, yes. He said, but I'm drunk. And I said, well, you're not planning on disrupting anything, are you? not planning on talking over me when I'm preaching, not planning on creating a scene, no, then you're welcome. So you can be one of the good guys, you can be part of one of us, and you're welcome. But even if you aren't one of us, you're still welcome until you become a disruption. And when you become a disruption and you undo, now whether I'm talking about our program here or whether I'm talking about the church, there where Timothy is. He says, I give you this instruction so that you can fight the good fight, hold on to the faith, be of good conscience. But some have rejected this and they shipwreck their own faith. They, they have no faith anymore. It's been destroyed. Among them, and he gives a couple of people's names, he said, I handed them over to Satan. I'm not praying for them anymore. I'm not inviting them to come and be with us anymore. They're troublemakers. We're building up the kingdom of God. We're trying to get people saved. If you want to work with us and be one of us, great. If you want to come and sit here and watch us do what we do and not bother us, that's great too. But if you've got plans of messing with something God's trying to do, come and get him, Satan. They're yours. They're working for you. They're not part of what we're doing here. Um, that ends. Um, whoops, excuse me. I need to. Um, I got the wrong pen. Let me get today's date. Um, Nine thirteen fifteen. Um, we've got a few minutes. I need to show you a couple of videos. But first, I need to close the uh, video that we've been making.